Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on. So our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and, and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In this episode of Sense Making in a Changing World, It's my delight to welcome Willow Burzen, a wonderfully creative thinker and the founder and chief assembler of the Coalition of Everyone, who are bringing together people to hold conversations that renew trust, disrupt the politics of fear and build a politics of hope. Her key focus is on contributing to regeneration through designing pathways for transition and real systems change through deep democracy and putting people and the planet first. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Willow. I've been watching your work for a long time and we haven't actually met. We've spoken numbers of times and we're on various groups together. But um, even though you're in my hometown of of Melbourne, um, we've not actually met. But I'm so delighted that you're joining me on the show today to talk about the work that you do. Uh, it's, It's the work that needs to be done. I mean, essentially what you're trying to do is to create the space for the really challenging conversations to be, to be had so that we can create the conditions for change and, and disrupting them in a way that enables people to get involved and to shape the kind of future that we want to have. So there's so many different parts of this juicy conversation that I'm looking forward to, to having with you today. And, um, now maybe we could just start before we get into sort of what it is that you do and why you do it. I'm sorry, what it is and how you do it. What is the, 
what fuels you to get involved in 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 these big conversations about the change we need to see in the world? Oh, I'm all right. Thank you. That's a beautiful, warm welcoming, and and thank you for having me. Um, that's a really good question, and I think it, it stems from a, a deep personal desire to be useful. Actually, um, that kind of goes way back. Um, and I suppose most of us are driven to it in points, but then we get stuck in our system a bit and just have to having to survive. And um, there's a few different ways that sometimes I wonder why I'm compelled to keep doing this work. And I think there's sort of democracy is one thing. And then there's why do I think I can do anything is um, I suppose different competing parts of the story. So for me, good democracy is something that we need to as, as some kind of a, an invisible glue to help us figure out how to work together and collaborate together and overcome all of the things that um, keep us divided and separate. And that's not necessarily how somebody else might determine or define democracy, but that for me is is what it's becoming and why I'm drawn to it. I think also bad democracy is like bad parenting. Well, it makes me angry and that disempowered feeling that you can get when decisions are being made about your future that you don't feel like you're a part of, that you're not um, included in making and that somebody else is making for their interests and not the best for your own. And that also makes me angry. So there's kind of a a frustration and an anger that goes back to, you know, for me probably childhood stuff too and some slightly shitty parenting along the way from my father. <laughs> that's an understatement. It's kind of fueled some sense of, but that's not right. This is, this is there's a better way. Um, and, um, and I think that's my kind of attraction to being in this space on one hand. Um, and then, yeah, I spent sort of... A, 20 years working as a creative director in a building brands and services and products and lots of digital um, outcomes and in the startup space for nearly, I think, about 10 years um, and sort of gathered all of these tools but was always frustrated with the outcome, I suppose, and I worked for big brands and I worked for big agencies and met amazing people and got to cut my teeth doing amazing work with amazing people but it was never for anything that really mattered and I suppose my personal concern is we're all our growing concern for the trajectory of humanity and our children is terrifying it's like hang on we've got to join this up um somehow Mm. and and yeah and it, it became like there's a gap why there's a gap and why aren't we using democracy better to help us through this time to make better decisions together. I think think it's the long and the short of it. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of really relate to you when you're saying you can't really define necessarily like why it is that you keep needing to do this thing about feeling useful. I I kind of really relate to that. It just is this, this inner flame or fire that burns that when you see something or see the injustice of it that like I can't pinpoint a particular moment when I felt that way but I I can't remember not feeling this way Mm -hmm. and uh and it just is a constant design when you see something that is going wrong and and really obviously wrong yeah and that there's another story that's that's there to be to shared or to be woven anew that the giving voice and space for that to emerge, I think, is important. And what you talk about in in what you how you describe what you do is like deep systems change. So what does what does deep systems change mean to you? Because I've I'd love that expression and I think it's it's what's needed in the world. But what does yeah. it mean to you? That's a good question too. Wow. So yeah, nodding vigorously there. Um look I, I that's a good question. I don't know if I could answer it. Because I feel very much like an, I'm an apprentice um, systems thinker, doer person, and just on a massive learning journey, um, which also is an unlearning journey too, equally. And um, for me, sit, yeah, I'm not trained. I'm just 
listening and reading and watching and kind of by the process of going further and deeper into the work, trying to understand more. Um, I think it's some sense of being able to zoom out beyond ourselves and our immediate um, needs for survival and love and human, all of the human things, and to zoom out and to understand um, why we are where we are and how we are where we are, and then also around where the leverage points are that we can try and help shift. And the, the, com- uh, 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 the complexity of our systems as well. And I think um, I, st- I was reading a book by um, Thomas Campbell, who's a NASA physicist. It's taken me 10 years to read the first part. Um, he's oh, absolutely incredible. And he was talking about, um, and it's kind of a, like a learned knowledge as well, so that's why it's going to take me so long. He was talking about, you know, our interconnected uh, systems, of the, there's the global ecosystems, and not eco as in green, but eco as in um, uh, whole systems that fit within a greater whole of the political, the social, the ecological, the, um, what's that for, the, the technical, technological, and I've not but on, oh, and of course the environmental, which is the one that we, we think of the most, but how these big, huge systems now at sort of global scale are all interconnected um, and we can't really break about one thing without understanding how they all connect to the others. And so when I was at the beginning of um, the idea of building the coalition of everyone, I was sort of looking at this and, try, and, and understanding that, well, Climate change is just a symptom for a, of a greater, um, deeper systemic issue that we have in our political and our social systems. Um, and the collapse of, you know, biodiversity and, and the climate is because of the fact that we are running in very outmoded political and social systems that are collapsing. And now through the pandemic, they're collapsing even more deeply. Like we're all watching in real time the fissures of our systems just cracking open and, and, and at the same time as that, trying to understand how we can rebuild through them while they're collapsing around us and we're watching it going, what's going on? And everybody's pretty freaked out. And so I don't, mm, systems thinking. I find I've, I've always enjoyed zooming out. I remember being about 16 or 15 and lying in my bed and having a very strange experience where I did zoom really far out and had a sense of the people and the planet and it totally freaked me out and I kind of came back to my body and went, whoa. And I suppose um, that's sort of a part of it is sort of trying to be able to step away from self into uh, this is my version. Other people will maybe have more a more analytical pragmatic sense version but but having a sense of that we're all connected and that we're all one really actually we're just little nodes of difference but that what affects one affects all i think that's at the core of, of system thinking we're working at the moment with um fridge of capra with the premier youth and so we're having these great conversations um working through his system thinking book and and you know they're asking questions of him, and and I mean that's at the core of it. When you when the session we just had this last week was you know saying if you're a scientist, you know, and you focus down and down and down, what you get to is this, you know, this interconnected fabric of life. If you're if you're meditating, you're coming from a spiritual perspective. You you sort of meditate for a long time, and you get to the point of recognizing the oneness. And I was thinking, well, as a gardener, as a permaculture gardener, I sit in my garden for long enough and I recognise the oneness of that whole system. It, you know, that's applied systems thinking is permaculture. And, yep. and so I think it, it is. And, you know, Nora Bateson talks about how everything is relational and it's about how we look at the liminal space, the space in between. It's not focusing on the parts but how the parts interconnect. And just <laughs> one other thing that um, Fritjof was talking about the other day was how you know, he was talking about where life comes from and basically that all life stems from one common ancestor, which is bacteria. Yes. So we are all related We and we are not just related with the living things. We also have a constant exchange and interchange with, with the non-living environment. And so 
all life and the environment on this planet is connected as one whole. And then there's also the, you know, the things that come in and out of our planetary system. So there is an, a, you know, and then my daughter asked, so, so do we have a sense of the membrane of the universe? And, and Fritjof said, well, that's a very Maya question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it keeps asking <laughs> big questions. And no, and he says, I can't answer that through science. You know, that is something that you have to answer from a different way of knowing. Mm. Um, so yes, oneness is, is kind of at the, at the core of it, whichever way you look and the relational, relationality of everything. And yep. so what you're doing with the, the um, coalition of everyone, creating the conditions where people can have those conversations and connect between the different, so stepping out of silos of knowledge or this group talks just about permaculture or this group just talks about you know, economy or this group just talks about health, that we need everyone in the room. Yep. And we need everyone to come into that room with a sense of of just openness, let go of your scripts, and to sort of have this sense of of being there for a for that common purpose, that meta. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about your coalition of everyone and how that works? And and I know that it's 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 like a it's a disruption of of democracy as you're talking about. But I wonder maybe as you're describing it too, how you talk about the disruption that COVID's had on your disruption of democracy as well, because it's always, it's been a bit challenging this last year, hasn't it? Maybe I'll just step back a second. So the Coalition of Everyone is an idea that has come in the past couple of years and a bunch of us have, have been helping develop it. Um, it's an idea name, so it is what it says on the tin, but hopefully it's a whole lot more in that, in that we've been developing um, a framework and spent quite a at least maybe the first year in sort of R and D, developing um, these deep democracy tools to help us cross the divide and come together and start to make decisions together and collaborate on the things that matter. Um, and the heart of it really is is the framework. So that at one end um, we have um, citizen and um, community led change and how to have events that bring people together to discuss the things that matter and to make decisions together. And then at the other end of the framework is then more for, say, um, citizen assemblies for policy-led change and how um, these work but can also step out of the uh, closed doors of it being only applicable to um, to government and how these can also um work together, I suppose, in the relationship of a top-down and a bottom-up um, approach because we can't do one without the other. One without the other is not going to work. We need them both and working together in a coordinated sense. Um, and within within that framework too, actually, what came from last year in the disruption of the disruptions um, was a conversation that I started with a, with a bunch of amazing people around Australia around how we can shift the narrative because there was a, a quick conversation, I think, from our federal leaders talking about the desire to snap back. It was like, why would we want to snap back when what was before was hurting a lot of people and the planet? There's got to be better ways. And actually that at the heart of this is all storytelling and that it's the stories that we can access that help us understand the world um, and that there's a way to create a new narrative. What might that look like? So it was a question. And so we had a, an 18-week conversation <laughs> that led to a project called the Future Now Project, um, which is around a set of tools to help people dream and imagine and forward so you can enter into a, a safe and protected environment by yourself or in groups to um, feel where and what and how your desired world might be like. What does it smell like and how does it feel like and what are people doing and what can you hear and what's on the news and what does work look like and how are people engaging, those sorts of questions. Um, and the tools have been developed to help people access that so we can have a, a lived experience of what that future might feel like um, so we can start to take the steps towards that. So they've become that's sort of become the heart of the framework actually. Um, and it's really about activating imagination and, and to try and snap out of our consumerist, neoliberalist mindset that sort of really 
doing terrible things to our imagination because we're just like, well, no, I just have to be on the rat race and I've just got to go and work and then I've got to go and shop and then I've got to take my holiday and get back on the wheel. And that's not life. That's not what we're here for because we're so much more than that. So this is about trying to help people find that and then to tell the stories onto the platform. I think it's interesting. Sorry, I just need to interrupt you there because I think it's really interesting that you are you have this focus on imagination and it's about transition. Um, talking with Rob Hopkins, you know, who started the whole transition movement out of the UK, and you know, his latest work is all around imagination and say that you know, like we actually have a, a like a, we we have a lack of imagination now in politics, a lack of imagination in education, and we don't cultivate this curiosity and this imagination and that in order to actually step forward, as you're saying, into a different reality, we have to have a different concept of what that reality could be like. And um, and so I totally agree. I think imagination is the key and giving ourselves the space to imagine what that might be like and to hear other people's stories and imaginings uh, and you know, from all different cultures and places as well. Exactly. And what I find interesting too is that when you start to share that imagining across cultures, even across, you know, places that you think would be so disparate, there's real, really interesting common themes and common desires and common concerns that underpin all of that. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's on our platform at the moment there's I don't know maybe about 30 different visions at the minute we're looking to um, publish invite people to hold more of these and publish more but everybody wants sort of the same things now admittedly this is one particular niche audience um, because it's still just a growing um, beginning of the project Um, and we're really interested in, in speaking with more diverse audiences too to start to identify what are the commonalities and if we're all looking for uh, creating common futures, then our politics is saying something and doing something else. And I think, again, that's the role of democracy, that actually without it we can't reconnect um, ourselves with our trajectory. Mm. Um, and another part of what you've been doing with the, the Coalition of Everyone, uh, Citizen Assemblies, which is also what, XR has been using as a way to bring people together. Can you describe a bit about what a citizen assembly is, how it works and what what your experience has been uh, working through these events? Yeah. So I first heard about them actually through XR. I'd never heard of them before. Um, I was like, what is that? That sounds really interesting. Um, And it's... A real, it's so I think it's about a decade for the past sort of decade or more. There's been a whole lot of different, um, citizen assemblies have been held around the world. And, and as Chris Reedy says, I think we're in about the third generation of what this democratic renewal processes look like. Um, and citizen assemblies are a very powerful tool when they are designed and facilitated, um, well. They can be used in different forms and at the highest level, for example, um, some of the most successful ones was in Ireland. They had a citizen assembly on um, abortion and for a very religious company, uh, country, (laughs) um, they actually came to a decision where um, they were giving rights for abortion. So it's it's a deliberative process. for a citizen assembly to be effective, it needs to be auspiced by government or the people who are going to be changing the policy that the assembly um, just deliberates and decides upon. That's probably the hardest part for people to, I think, appreciate because without it being auspiced that the findings will be adhered to, it's just, unfortunately, it can be just another talk fest. So they need to be well held and um, the, to maintain legitimacy, this needs to be a very kind of protected, um, quite serious, um, institutionalized sort of piece. So there's amazing people doing these really well around the world. So in Sydney, there's New Democracy Foundation doing amazing citizens assemblies here and abroad as well. Um, and I completely respect that work. 
we think that these can be done at a more local level as well in a complementary sense, that it doesn't need to be just at state or federal level. Um, and my co-founder, Sonia, Dr Sonia Randhoa, held a small citizen assembly with a community house in Moreland in November last year about Build Back Better. And it's the same process as a larger one that might have a couple of hundred people, but um, it doesn't need to be just at state and federal level. So these can be done at any kind of point to make better decisions, so long as the people who are making the decisions are there and are buying into the outcomes that the people there are deliberating and deciding upon as better what, outcomes for any kind of problem statement that they might choose to. Yeah, what kind of questions are asked at a citizen assembly? Like what were the questions you asked at that one? Um, I actually wasn't there, so I can't tell you, but I know for in France they recently held one on the climate. I think there's there's been some interesting outcomes and, of course, then the bigger problems are that maybe the government doesn't want to actually adhere to the findings of the assembly. So that's where there's a lot of tensions and people will be saying, well, they don't work or they do work. But actually, look, it's an evolving piece where there's constant learning um, and improvement and iterations been happening on these there's a there's a a standing assembly which is very interesting that's happening in is it Belgium or Brussels uh, on the border of Belgium and Germany I can't remember exactly in a small place um, maybe edit that bit out <laughs> but, um, there's a standing assembly happening um, in a small smaller country in Europe that um, means then that there will be representation from citizens being invited to deliberate upon whatever are the biggest issues of the day. Um, and so another kind of mechanism uh, that helps citizens' assemblies be legitimate is using sortition as a way to, um, it's a random selection process to ensure that you're actually inviting a broad demographic or a representative de demographic to then deliberate upon a, a, a question. So, for example, in Australia, if we're heading towards 25 million, it would be very hard to engage 25 million people. But if you were to hold a citizens' assembly at a national level here, you might end up with maybe 150 or 200 people who are representative of, you know, different genders, um, socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, um, all of the different things that make up our population would be split and percentiled so that then you have a representative cohort who are the people that can then come together in a very non-biased deliberative process where people are, where participants are asked to um, use their critical thinking and taken through exercises and it's all uh, taken through with, you know, expert facilitators to make sure that everybody's voice is heard as well. It's not just the loudest people in the room. Um, to come together to make decisions together. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose our framework is sort of taking the principles of that at the highest level for policy led change and then all the way down to just community level for community groups, for anyone, and it might be a mix of people coming together on an issue that includes business, government, uh, community, whatever it may be, to follow a similar process. Um, but perhaps not affecting policy. And I think interesting advocacy in that, yeah. Yeah, I think an interesting thing too, just as you were speaking, is like not necessarily all the time everything needs to be about policy change either. Like if you're doing an event like this and it's affecting change in how groups form and collaborate at a bioregional level, for example, and then those collaborations then form new initiatives and partnerships and actions. Exactly. Then change is happening anyway. We don't have to wait for the for government to change. I was yep. having a really great conversation with um, Stuart Andrews um, from Forage Farms and Maloon Farm the other day, and he was talking about how, you know, he spent a lot of time talking with government to try and get policy change. But what he's realised is what's creating the great, greatest change in the food system is actually the farmers and the consumers talking together and, and making change. And, and, and so the conversations can happen at different places. and. Yep. And assuming that the power always happens at the government and that it's feeding everything into that yep. might actually be dissipating the effectiveness of it because 
you know, while that needs to happen, the change um, needs to happen at, at a much broader level first before that will even become a reality. So these are creating the conditions, these conversations, these broader conversations, whether they're the, I guess, your, um, you know, like people imagining or people coming together in these sorts of um, events are creating the conditions for change and the conditions for creating change somewhere else because it's not a, just a straight linear process, is it? It's kind no. of creating this complex soup of, of like you're saying, deep systems change um, in our own selves. And then, you know, like if you participate in one of these events, you are changed by the very nature of being a participant in that. Something will shift in how you perceive things. You'll hear someone else's idea that sits in there and rattles around and then it kind of becomes you and then you might go and talk differently at the next meeting that you have to make decisions about what's happening in your organisation and your company or your family. And so these, these things do change us at very deep levels, whether we notice it or not, simply by coming together and having these really important conversations. And so sometimes it can feel a little bit disempowering that we're not getting policy change, but we are getting change. And I think really valuing that deep change that's happening in our perceptions, in our relationships, in our local actions is, I think, often where some of the, the main power happens. And it's kind of like this myceliating network as well. Like it's just happening underground everywhere and it just every now and then it pops up and you'll see, you'll see it here and you'll see it here, but it's everywhere around the world and that's what kind of gives me a sense of strength. Like if you compost areas enough socially, you will get these flourishing and it will feed that mycelium network and the change will just be so strong that the policy, policy shift will have to happen. But the, the thing that, that's really struggling, that we, we all struggle with at the moment is, is that fast enough? Is that's, that what we need? You know, we are facing really catastrophic events. We've, you know, um, I was talking with Rosemary Morrow the other day and she reminded me that we've already pushed past a number of, um, you know, what are they called? Thresholds, ecological thresholds. You know, we really can't push past it anymore. And, uh, you know, there was a report that came out from Cornell University the other day saying that um, because of climate change, 21, we've had 21% reduction in, in uh, food farming productivity. Yeah. So we have to start doing things really, really differently. And these conversations are, are so critical. So I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about how you're addressing this through your regeneration, um, is it Regeneration Melbourne or Regenerative Melbourne? Pro Regen Melbourne. Regen Melbourne, there you go. I had yeah. too many letters We're on there. Sure Regen can. Melbourne, that's simpler, <laughs> thank you. And so how is Regen Melbourne facing this? And it's different, again, what you're doing there. Yeah. Oh, you touched on so many things there, and it's all it's all so true. So, yeah, I think um, Regen Melbourne has, has come about um, after Kate Raworth, who's a um, an author from who wrote to had a thing like a 21st century economist and has developed the donut economics framework. She did a talk at the Small Donuts Academy in the middle of last year um, and a bunch of us all put our hands up and said, how do we do that here? Um, and, and I was one of those people because, again, you know, our economic systems is actually one of the fundamental reasons why we're in this situation as well. Um, and it, and, it, and it would seem to be a very pragmatic kind of way that um, anyone, people like me who is who is not an economist and not good with numbers can understand economic systems and how to do economics better, just like we're trying to do politics and oh, actually not politics, we're trying to do democracy better, two very different ideas. Um, and um, and so with um, Kai from Small Dance Academy and, and Sean from the Circular Economy Victoria, who had been actually having this conversation with um, the City of Melbourne and, and RMIT and the Lord Mayor's Terrible Foundation since the beginning of last year, we got together and um, and formed Regen Melbourne, which is really about exploring a regenerative future for Melbourne and particularly through um, the, the lockdown that we had last year, which was one of the longest in the world. So it's really kind of crippled the city. It is it is trying to come back, but there is a very strong desire to go back to what was familiar and to snap back to the old ways. And so it feels like we're in this unique time to do things better and to reset 
some our systems. Um, and so this group has formed um, and we're exploring Donut Economics as our first project. However, as um, actually Bianca Anderson helped me understand that it is a great piece, but it's still only a, a small piece within a greater whole. And I suppose back to that system thinking sense, it's, it's, it's a fantastic diagnostic tool. It's a really accessible way to understand how the art of um, household management and how we need to be living within our ecological boundaries and within our social boundaries for a safe and just space for humanity and how you can downscale it to the city. It's amazing, but it's not everything. In a regenerative future, we think it's a bigger um, idea to move towards. Um, and so we officially started the project at the end of last year and it's been really about building the movement and then um, building the network, which is now about 600 people. We held some workshops. We held five workshops in February. Um, we're community workshops with the, with the network, and the network is quite a diverse range of movers and shakers and really great people in that network came to the events to help us uh, explore and play with the donut to gather information and insights to create an insights report which we'll be publishing at the end of April um, and this is sort of a very bottom-up led approach other cities around the world have been fortunate or well it's just a different approach to be doing much more of a top-down approach Amsterdam is the most ahead of the cities it started the soonest Kate Raworth was friends with I think the mayor there so she had a had a very different approach so Melbourne has working with the city of Melbourne, um, but at this point we are a bottom-up driven uh, approach and really looking for an inclusive and accessible way that everybody can understand how donut economics might be a better model to reboot to um, and, and how we can start to work together for a regenerative future and reboot our economic systems. And for me it's, it's actually the political, sorry, keep saying politics, it's the democratic uh, renewal piece, which is that we can do the work through. So what's been interesting so far, actually fascinating, is from the main insights that we've collected that empowering people is the key to unlock all of the other things that we want. And all of those other things, it's really up to people to decide. But without empowered people, we can't do anything. We're just stuck and trapped and we continue as we are and it's sort of, game over so we don't want that <laughs> i guess you know it's like empowered people but also um you know caring yeah you know like i think we we were on this path before covid happened where there was a, a mass i felt like to me it felt like a mass awakening you know like when when you've been working in this kind of world for decades all of a sudden there was this like great big door open to this is what's happening in the world, this is why we need to focus on this thing. And then we all just went, whoop, closed back up again. Oh, COVID, no, we can't go out, can't have gatherings, can't do that, can't do that. And everything just kind of stopped and all the news stopped about climate, all the news stopped about regen, all the news stopped about anything except for COVID. And I, and I wonder, you know, there is still, there is that, that opening that still exists, we just sort of have a little bit of a, a layer on it at the moment and it's finding that again And because there is this deep concern that underlies, I think, pretty much most people that I've ever speak to that we do need something different. And it's finding ways to, to sort of yeah, crack open different conversations all over the place. It means that people can engage and people can become, you know, active citizens because often we sort of feel like, yeah, it's a closed, done deal. The decisions get made somewhere else. We, you know, we're very obedient here in Australia. I mean, you look how we responded when, you know, when COVID happened. We we did what we were told. We, but I think there's also this point where we need to also go. Okay, well, we're a responsive and and uh, we were interested in the common whole. Then I think yeah. you know, like we were really interested in the well-being of our society. So how can we translate that sense of global oneness of response to our response of what's what's going on now and start to bring these global conversations back into 
back into the into the the front center of where we are like it feels like it just kind of fell away ah oh, look i think as well then there's sort of the further we dig in and try and under, uncover what's going on beneath the structures and facades that we call our society mm. You know what's happened in Parliament recently, and and the whole kind of Me Too movement that's sort of shaking that up here, and and the gender representation and abuse of, and then social justice and the deaths in custody. It's like at the heart of all of this is that we are living in a very colonized mindset, mm-hmm. and we actually have to decolonize our minds. And that's what I think is this sort of unlearning process as we try and learn new ways it's actually letting go of what we thought we knew um because all of this is not who we are and and for me it's sort of the further i go on this path of connecting with others and sort of talking about this work and and trying to figure out how to be useful and where to make good decisions that will actually affect change it really it starts with um ourselves and our relationships and and that kind of thing that we get when we start to um, use our vulnerability as a superpower and get more human and to just go back to care and forget about all the other bullshit, if you'll excuse me, which is just structures and based on fear, I think. Mm-hmm. I have these conversations with my mum. It's a fear of the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually we're just, we're all the same. Everybody wants the same things. I think then within our systems we're kind of, we have a chance to evolve past some old ways and it, maybe it's the evolution of consciousness, maybe it's it's something else, whatever we want to call it, um, and we have some psychopaths in power and some very vested interests who are just holding on to money and really holding back a lot of our systems, the chance for, for life to keep um, continue in, in at least the way that we knew it then. Um, wish for our planet and ourselves and going through that I think it's just it's it's got to be this bottom-up thing where we're just sort of trying to say here's how when you participate in in your life and you're given there's pathways that are clear and accessible that you can access and make decisions for yourself and your community and we can celebrate and nurture ourselves and the best of us which is really why we've survived this far is actually there's a debate I'm reading about in the, the Patterning Instinct, this amazing book, um, about um, how we have survived so far has actually been through collaboration. It hasn't been survival of the fittest. So there's different mythologies in what the human race is about. And our systems at the moment, we're quite stuck in some ways because we do have um, power that is just holding on for the wrong reasons. And I think the only way that's going to change is by helping ignite participation everywhere and deliberation everywhere. And I think is it the OECD, OECD calls it the deliberative wave. It's like people are recognising that this is how we can make change and celebrate everything that's good about being human and we can regenerate our world and ourselves a long way uh, at the same time. Beautiful. I, I love that. And I and I what I'm hearing in that is put your hand up, step in. You don't have to know everything. It's that that sort of courage to care and courage to be part of the change, part of reimagining what it is that that future is. Because like you're saying, that now is that moment. Like if not now, then when? You know, we we have we have the doors open for systems change now. We have you know, everything's disrupted, we can create new patterns and we may not know what that is. We may just go, I have no idea, but I want to be part of it. I want to be useful. I want to contribute to shaping something that's that's for, you know, for, for my kids, for my family, for my community, for the planet. We know what's what's looming. We see it around us. Sometimes it's you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of just put the blinkers on, but it just keeps coming back. We, we can't ignore it anymore. And so, yeah, putting your hand up, just simply saying yes and being part of it. 
and uh, yeah. finding a way to to join with other people in your local area or join with people, you know, in the programs like what you're organising. So how would you encourage people to put their hand, I mean, what way would you encourage people to put their hand up to be, to help unstick where yeah. we are now? I think there's two there's two parts to this. And one is what can we do within our spheres of influence? And it's not up to me or you to change the world. It's up to us to do what we can um, as as we are prepared to take more courageous leaps into doing things outside of what the system is trying to keep us trapped in. Um, and to have some confidence that the more you connect with more people, the more you can do, actually. The other thing I've already forgotten, but the 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 different ways that I think we can get involved, are, and it's really important actually that it's that it's that it's bringing everybody along for this journey because if we leave people behind, then we'll just collapse into other forms of authoritarianism and we'll make terrible decisions, like what happened with Brexit was because people are being left behind. So I think what's really important is as well is to um, for us to start to be better at inviting all of the unheard voices that don't get a chance to be thinking like this. I'm aware that I'm in a bit of a state of privilege to be able to spend time doing this when I should be doing other work um, because I passionately am involved in this. Um, but as far as actual things that we can do, look, the Regen Melbourne Network is growing and I invite anybody who's in Melbourne or even not in Melbourne to join into that. The, the website is regen.melbourne. Um, there are other cities I'm aware of just starting to light up around Australia too, um, and I'm happy to connect anybody to those. That's, I think, a really good way to sort of start as an access point, to sort of start to meet other people doing things, and there'll be more and more events as these um, develop and as we start to gear the next steps towards creating projects too that we can collaborate upon. Um so you might be somebody who thinks that they don't have any skills, but actually you do. You have energy and you have yourself to bring to these and it might be doing something that you forgot you knew how or something that you want to learn how to do. It doesn't matter. It's just being involved. And I think that sort of sense of momentum is how it will just keep building um, and that we do have a chance for a really bottom-up driven kind of pathway. So the, so the Regen Cities approach, exploring donut economics, is, is all sort of very exciting and just starting. I think that's awesome. Actually, it thrills me to no end. It tickles me pink. <laughs> and then there's also the um, the visioning assemblies that we've just been, we just held a, a visioning event at the NGV Design Week, and that is for the Future Now project with Regen Melbourne and with the Coalition of Everyone. So for non non Melbourneites, that's NGV is the National Gallery of Victoria. Yes, thank you. Um, and that is how you might want to sort of, if you feel blocked or trapped, or that you don't know what this might look like, or feel like it's it's an invitation to experience what your ideal future might be. So we can start to step towards it. And we're actually going to pilot a regenerative um, incubator program in the middle of the year to invite people with ideas that need help to get their ideas off the ground and how we can connect those ideas into the greater network and to unlock capital eventually as well so that we can start to turbocharge all of this. So there's amazing people doing amazing stuff. We've just got to get everybody connected up and finding their role, I think, actually, because we all have a role to play in the great transition. It's finding it and not being paralysed by the fear or the narrative that is really trying to hold hold us back and, and default to what was the old way, let's call it, pre-COVID, because yeah. it's a better way. We've just yeah. got to find it together and make yeah, it. Yeah, that's fun. right. Oh, that's that's a beautiful way to to wrap up our conversation. There's an invitation to participate and everyone everyone can and, and has something to offer, however big or small, and in whether you're skilled or or it's something that you're wanting to do, I think that's I think that's just brilliant. And that it that it is about it is a, it's a we thing, isn't it? It's not a yeah. you or me. It's a we, and uh, and it's the the future that we want to help um, create. Because you know, you're a, you're a mother. I'm a mother. We're all you know beings in this planet that we love dearly and want to see continue long into the future. I think it hurts a lot that we're in such peril, 
Yeah. And positive programs and, and connections like this are essential for the, not just for the, for the planet, but for, for our own self as well in, in this too. Yeah. And yeah, we need to build hope mm. and for our children and, and for our friends' children, if we don't have children or, or our families and all of the non living world as well. Sorry, non human world. Mm. This is for all of us. Yeah. Um, in service to life we just we have everything else is kind of madness <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much willow i'll make sure that all of the different links and and also the really interesting books that you mentioned along the way too i'll pop those all in the in the show notes and and so are you open for people contacting you to yeah, find out absolutely. more information You'll, yeah we'll put, we'll put contact details down below as well Thanks so much for your time today and, and I look forward to ongoing conversations in Regen Melbourne and another group that we part of which we didn't even talk about, which is the Regenerative Songlines Project. So um, I had a chat with Michelle Maloney the other day about that. So we're, we've got, we're far, yeah, so that's good. All right, well, thank you again, Willow. It's, I, hope, I hope we get a chance to talk again soon. Thank you for having me, Mike. So that's all for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Head on over to my YouTube channel, the link's below, and then you'll be able to watch this conversation, but also make sure that you subscribe because that way you'll be notified of all new films that come out. And also you'll get notified of all the new, all the new interviews and conversations that come out. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great week and I'll see you next time.